If you are in a place in your life right now where maybe things are not going right, maybe things haven't gone right, and you feel yourself screaming out to God, Do you see me? Do you see this mess that's going on? Jesus has a message for you. <laughs> Before I called you, I saw you at your lowest point. I saw you at the peaks. I saw you at the valleys. I created you. I formed you. I gave you all the talents you have. I gave you all the abilities you have. And I gave you the heart that you have. But he doesn't say just sit there in the pews or go home and keep it to yourself. He has commandments. He says, come to church. Come and see. Hear the words that God has for you. The words to uplift you. The words to encourage you. The words to give you hope. And then he says, go and tell others. Just like that woman at the well. Don't keep it to yourself. That living water that's welling up inside, that's bubbling, that's giving you your joy and your excitement. Go and tell others.
missing two years because of the pandemic, we will be hosting our fall luncheon on October 20th. Um, many of you have been very gracious about distributing posters, and thank you very much for doing that. Um, there will be a poster included with your newsletter this time. If you would like to donate a salad or dessert for the ministerial fundraiser on October 8th, uh, there is a sign-up sheet in the back of the church. And of course, the beautiful quilt that you're seeing at the front of the sanctuary, um, made by Bonnie DeForsman and um, Karen Wilsusan, will be raffled off. And if you know those two, their work is beautiful. Uh, it's a beautiful quilt. The chosen session two Bible study at the PUC Church on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. And the youth group meets at 2.30 p.m. on Wednesdays in Friendship Hall. CWF will meet this Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m. at the Senior Center and we'll be watching a video, a Max Lucado video called Happiness, How Happiness Happens. So if you're able to join us, we would love to have you all to be there. And of course we laugh a lot and you know how that goes when we all get together. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Will you join in the call to worship in your bulletin? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. For God is gracious and good. And very great to be praised. Our next hymn is found, found on page 70 in the chorus book, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And we're going to do verses 1, 2, and 4. Let's pretend a tithe is a concern. 
consumer transaction. Let's say you're paying me, whom you know, trust, and love, money to return the cost of that gift to you in a form of my choosing, because you know I love you. Well, the deacons come for Heart. What's 
sun. It's the eight. Eight of hearts. So we are going to bury that down in the deck just like that. Okay? And then we're going to just do a little shuffle here. We're going to mix up the cards. Just like that. Alright. So, is this your card? No. No. Is this your card? No. No. Alright. So it's buried in the deck then, right? So it's not on the front, not on the talking, so let's see, you guys haven't made it to the last Bible study. We're going to be talking about Jesus seeing us. Have you ever felt like maybe there were times when God didn't see you? Did you ever feel really sad? No. Yeah? Cry out to him and all her, do you see me? And you just feel like it goes on deaf ears? Well, see, here's the neat thing. That even though sometimes, kind of like this, we're just going to flip this one over so you can see. That's the bottom part, okay? There's the top one. So just like these cards, we kind of buried yours, didn't we, in the middle? And we can kind of feel lost. But, oh, there's one card in between that top and bottom. What if that card was actually <laughs> it's kind of cool, isn't it? So see, God saw you all along. He knew where you were at. And you were right in between. God, that's kind of cool. That was easy. So it was right in between God and Jesus. You were never lost. Okay, watch where that's me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that even when we feel like we're lost in the shuffle, we're lost in the middle we are still sandwiched right in between you and Jesus, and you never leave us and never forsake us. In the name we pray. Amen. I'm just still trying to figure it out. <laughs> I'm just impressed it worked out in all the places. <laughs> okay, you guys need to go down to Sunday school. Well, did you notice the title in the bulletin? I see you. If you ever needed any more encouragement than that, I don't know what it would be. I see you. Today we looked at Philip and Nathaniel in the Gospel of John, but you know, it wasn't just Nathaniel that Jesus saw. It started way back before that. And that's why I really, really encourage you, if you've not been watching this, the seasons of The Chosen, you really need to because it just brings the scriptures to life. And in fact, for those that have been watching, how many knew that this whole transaction, the entire thing, was word-for-word -word scripture? It makes a difference when you can see it in living color right before your eyes. But there was somebody that Jesus saw before Nathaniel. And we kind of looked at this uh, about two months ago. I did a sermon on the Good Samaritan, and I said I wanted to do it, but it would be later, but we kind of rehashed that story. So let me ask here, who knows the story of the Good Samaritan? Hoping all hands will go up. Yeah. Well, what the Chosen did with this particular story, this is after the woman at the well, and he's in Samaria, and the scriptures just say that afterwards Jesus and his disciples spent two or three days in Samaria. That's it. They don't tell you what happened. But that doesn't mean that nothing happened during that time. And what I like is they, they live out the parables and we don't know. Jesus very, very well have experienced the story and that's how he turned it into a parable. Could be. But what I like what they did with the Good Samaritan was there was a gentleman who was a Samaritan and as you know they were hated by Jews and he had done some things in the past he was not happy about. And life just went worse. He ended up with a lame leg and he couldn't provide for his family anymore. And Jesus comes and he has James and John work his field and they think that they're just doing it for travelers because they don't like Samaritans. And Jesus invites himself to supper. He brings supper to this man's house. And in the process of talking to him, 
He finds out his story. Through this episode, his story is he is one of the robbers of the Good Samaritan. I love that angle. Now this man was not a bad man. He was a good father and a good husband and he was trying to provide. They fell on rough times, desperate times called, unfortunately, for desperate measures. And it's real easy to sit back and judge people by the mistakes they make when we're not in their shoes. But if we put ourselves in their shoes, sometimes we wonder, what would we have done? In the process, his job was to sell the Jew's horse and take it to the Roman outpost to sell it for the money. But after the man had been knocked off the horse, robbed, and left for dead, he got about 10 miles and 10 minutes away, and the horse reared, and he fell off and broke his leg, and now he was worse than he was before. And he's lived with this guilt his whole life. He thinks the guy died. And it's this person that Jesus seeks out, out of everybody, to go to his house. And he didn't go to heal his leg. He went because he saw him. He saw what was in his heart. He saw what he was struggling with. And after the gentleman tells his story and he's sobbing because every night he thinks he's been a murderer, Jesus looks at him and he says, that man did not die. And he looks at him in bewilderment and he says, no, I tell you truly, someone came along and helped that man and he did not die. The weight that was lifted off of his heart and his mind and his conscience was the first round of healing because Jesus saw him. He saw what he needed. And then, of course, only in Jesus' fashion, the next morning when he wakes up, his leg is healed as well. But Jesus has a command for him. He didn't just like, I'm healing you and, and you go back and do whatever. He tells him, he says, you need to read the Torah. And the guy goes, I can't read. And he says, and you need to get back into the synagogue, which would basically be church, and hear the Torah. He commanded him to basically come and see inside the walls of the synagogue what God had to say to him. You know, when things like that happen to us and we fall on bad times, and life just keeps seeming to hit us blow after blow, it is very, very easy to want to become inclusive, to haul up in your house, and to not be around anybody, and to shake your fist at God and say, do you see me? Jesus says, come and see. You need to get back to church. You need to get back to hear the word of God. That, young, that man was not the only one. He first came to the woman at the well when she was at the lowest of her lows. And Jesus told her everything she had ever done. And then she went off telling everyone about Jesus. He saw her at her lowest point. He sought her out and healed her. We see with Philip and Nathaniel, Philip was one of the disciples of John the Baptist, along with Andrew. And Philip leaves John the Baptist, and he comes to Jesus. And when Philip shows up, all Jesus says is, follow me. And he knew. He had been stuttering, studying under John the Baptist. He was there when Jesus was baptized. He saw heavens open up and declare that this is my son. So Philip has a friend by the name of Nathaniel. Now, the scriptures are very sketchy. We don't know anything about Nathaniel at all. From Bethesda, but that's about it. In The Chosen, we're told that in this, his story, he's an architect. But his heart is in the right place. He's wanting to build something for God. Something that people can worship and praise God. And I love this because if you're like me growing up, this is so sketchy. This is when Jesus finds him. 
He says, I saw you under the fig tree. Now, I knew nothing of Israel. I knew nothing of any of these towns. I just, you know, picturing this town square, like they have a town square. There was a town square, you know, and I'm picturing just this tree. And Philip or Nathaniel standing over there by it. And he says, I saw you over by the tree. No, that's not what was going on at all. There's not a fig tree in any of these towns. Let me just tell you right there. So right there, if there's not a fig tree there, where did Jesus see him? This is the part I love about what the Chosen has done. Do we know if it's completely accurate? No, we don't, but it sure makes a lot more sense. So Nathaniel is at his lowest of lows. The one thing his heart desired that he's wanted to do for God forever comes crumbling down, and he's left with rubble. And he goes out into the wilderness, and he finds a fig tree, and he's sitting at the bottom of it, looking up into the sky, and he starts hollering scripture at God. We kind of do that, don't we? He says from David, from Psalms and Isaiah, don't turn your face away from me. <laughs> Incline your ear when I'm screaming out to you. Or in English terms, really, God, where are you? Are you not seeing what's going on? I'm doing all this for you. How come nothing's going right? And then when he's at the lowest of lows, he yells out to God, Do you see me? I think we've all been there, haven't we? At some point in time. And then when Philip brings, when he comes to Nathaniel, Nathaniel laughs at him, right? He goes, <coughs> Who? Jesus of Nazareth? Can anything come, good come from Nazareth? And you have to realize, now what happened to Jesus when he was in Nazareth? They tried to run him out of town and off a cliff. Not a lot came from Nazareth that was good. But what does Philip say to Nathaniel? Come and see. <laughs> I love on the episode. He says, what have you got to lose? If, if you don't, like what you see, I'll return your misery to you. I love that line. So Nathaniel shows up. He comes into town and Jesus sees him. And as he's coming up, he says, Ah, here's an Israelite. Of one there is no deceit. Nathaniel's going, how do you know me? And then he said, I saw you. Now, in the Chosen, I love, he added the line, At your lowest point, I did not turn my face away. But I saw you when you were under the fig tree. And Nathaniel just melts. But here's the interesting thing. The very man who was questioning and said, What good could possibly come from Nazareth? He is the only one up to this point in time in scriptures, the first one to say, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Let that soak in for just a minute. The one who scoffed is the very first one to acknowledge that Jesus was the Messiah. That doesn't give you goosebumps. I don't know what will. You know, we're a lot like these disciples. Sometimes we like to think, oh, they were the Jesus' top 12, so we tend to put them up on a pedestal or something. They had to have been so much better than everyone else. No, they were a bunch of ragtag people, men and women, who Jesus saw, knew their strengths, knew their talents, and simply said the two words, follow me. If you are in a place in your life right now where maybe things are not going right, maybe things haven't gone right, and you feel yourself screaming out to God, do you see me? Do you see this mess that's going around? Jesus has a message for you. Before I called you, I saw you at your lowest point. I saw you at the peaks. I saw you at the valleys. I created you. I formed you. 
I gave you all the talents you have. I gave you all the abilities you have. And I gave you the heart that you have. But he doesn't say just sit there in the pews or go home and keep it to yourself. He has commandments. He says, come to church. Come and see. Hear the words that God has for you. The words to uplift you. The words to encourage you. The words to give you hope. And then he says, go and tell others. Just like that woman at the well. Don't keep it to yourself. That living water that's welling up inside, that's bubbling, that's giving you your joy and your excitement. Go and tell others that I see them too. So for those of you, I guess I, I found out that there was an email that went out. You uh, didn't get a chance to hear. See, if you come to Bible study, you would have known about it. <laughs> so on Tuesday, I, I've mentioned many times that, you know, God, everything's in God's timing and God's ways. And he had put a passion in my heart back when I was in my 20s. I wanted so bad to be a speaker on a big stage that I could tell people about the love of God. And I could encourage them and give them hope. And, and things felt like they were going into place and then they just didn't. And I kept getting wait for it and wait for it. And I did. And I was told, you know, 40 is the big year. That's when everybody else made it big. And I was 39 and 40 came and 40 went. <laughs> and nothing. And I remember crying out when I was about, well, 40 to 45. Going, do you see me? Everybody else is getting their chance, and I'm not. And I finally said, Lord, if you don't want me to do this, take that passion away. I'm, I'm happy doing what I'm doing, but I still want more. And he didn't take that passion away. In fact, I got wait for it. Well, as in God's time, that's how it always happens, just in a blink of an eye. So Tuesday, out of nowhere, I, in fact, I was walking in Sam's Kelly time while my husband was in therapy, and I get a call from Tana, who doesn't always get to the emails immediately, but there was an email that came in with an expiration date of 48 hours, and she said, you need to see this. I said, what is it? She goes, you've been invited to a conference. And I'm thinking it's just a conference to attend. She goes, no, they want you to speak. And I'm like, really? I'm like, wow. And then I said, well, where's it at? And she goes, it's in London. I said, oh, it's a scam. <laughs> Isn't, isn't that horrible? When God gives us stuff, our first inclination is, if it's too good to be true, right? It probably is. Don't get your hopes up. Don't get your hopes up. So I nonchalantly and coolly emailed this gal back and thanked her for the invitation, but I was waiting for her to say, give us your credit card information and we'll get you your tickets. And I didn't. I got this big email back. It's the 2023 Passion. It's not just women's, but it's college age group. Conference. They've been doing this since 2019, and it's been right here in America, in Atlanta, Georgia, and Dallas, Texas. But this is the first year that it's in London, England. I kept telling you that there's a harvest that's about ready to explode. We haven't seen it right here yet, but we are on the verge. And overseas, I've been talking about Paul and Max, the people that have been coming in the droves to hear the word of, Lord, of God and to accept Christ. It's happening in Europe, too. And only in God's fashion could he take somebody from Nebraska who hasn't gotten to do anything like this to be the only international speaker in London, England in January. And you know what it was about? I'm pretty darn sure. We did a series on the appreciation inquiry that I did. It was on hope and despair and joy and resiliency and all that stuff. When I took that class, I didn't know why I was to take the class. I have nothing else. I got four good sermons out of it. I thought, well, maybe God wants me to do more with this, and he didn't. And I'm like, okay. But when I did those services, I took that sermon, and I showed it to our instructors to let them know what kind of an impact it had. And they posted that YouTube link up. The people that was on Zoom around the world saw every single one of those messages. And it was because of those messages is how I got seen for London, England. God's good. 
Sometimes we have to wait a little longer than we think. And yeah, it hasn't really soaked in yet. As we get closer, I'll start freaking out, I'm sure. But God does see us. He knows everything about us. If he's implanted something in your heart that you should do, don't ignore it, even if it takes decades, even if it seems like it's falling on deaf ears, even if there's times that we think that God has just lost us in the deck. He hasn't. He's seen us, and he's waiting for just the right moment to say, okay, now, go and tell everybody that I see them too. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer, I know that there are many on our hearts that we want to lift up. Um, I have a lot that just happened today. Also, I need to mention that Karen Radcliffe, the lady that comes from York, um, she has another sore, and this one's not healing. She has two weeks to try to get it to heal where she'll be back in the hospital, and I know she is not looking forward to that because when she goes, it takes weeks and months for that stuff to heal. Um, so if we can just keep her in our prayers. Um, we want to remember everybody in Florida with the hurricanes. I know that there are, between all of the different denominations, there are uh, mission groups that are pulling together funds and supplies and help, so that is nice that we are all part of the body of Christ. And on this World Communion Sunday, it shows just how connected we are and we are all together helping one another in that time of need. Are there others that we'd like to lift up? I know that there are many that are struggling right now, too, that are on our hearts and minds, that names have not been said. If you would bow your heads with me right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We come with our hearts full, some with pain, some with anger, some with trepidation, some with fear, some with wondering, some with joy, and some with awe. There is so much going on in the world and in our lives. Sometimes we just feel like we are in the midst of that hurricane, being battered from all sides, and all we can do is button down the hatch and hide inside. Thank you for letting us know that when we make our petitions known to you, when we call out and seek your face, that you do see us. We ask for healing for those who need physical healing. We ask for emotional healing for those who need their hearts mended. We ask for spiritual healing for those who have drifted away. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would ignite a passion inside each and every one of us to go out there and be that beacon, to be your instrument to tell people to come and see to reassure them that no matter what's going on in their life, that you do see them. We thank you for your son who came and became incarnate. He lived among us. He became one of us. So that way he could save us. We thank you for all these gifts, the gifts of salvation. And we thank you that even when we're at our lowest point, whether we're sitting under a fig tree or not, when we are left without words, he even taught us a prayer that we can pray to you anytime. And the peaks and the valleys. If you would join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come 
before Christ's feast on this World Communion Sunday. We come together with our brothers and sisters all around the world, eating and drinking. Remember, we remember that night in which Christ sat with those 12 of his closest apostles, disciples at that time, that were getting ready to get their instructions to go out. He sat with them and he lifted up that middle piece of matzah, the one that represented the Messiah. Only this time when he picked it up, he gave thanks and he broke it and he said, this is now going to be my body, which will be broken for you. Every time you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. And then he picked up not just any of the five cups, but the cup that represented salvation. And he picked it up and he gave thanks and he blessed it. And he said, this is now going to be a new covenant. It's going to be my blood which will be poured out for the forgiveness of all sin. Every time you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. And so as the body of Christ all over the world throughout all of time, we have come before its table that is open and invited to all. Come eating and drinking, remembering his death, his resurrection, but then being called to go out and proclaim to all his coming again.
in receiving and acknowledging your grace, may we become more gracious. In receiving and acknowledging your compassion and forgiveness, may we become more compassionate and more forgiving. Let this wine be a symbol of Christ's love for us and of our transformation to the new life that you offer. in the unbelievable love of a God who sees you and the love of his son who calls you to come and see experience the goodness he has to offer and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that keeps us all connected as the body of Christ around the world together as one in and through him now and forever. 